<laughs> Georgian Bay Forever grew out of the GBA in 1995. Georgian Bay Forever is a registered Canadian charity with supporters throughout the region, including concerned cottagers and residents, businesses, and foundations. Their mission is to preserve, protect, and enhance the aquatic ecosystems of Georgian Bay. Our next presenter is Mr. David Sweetnam. He is the executive director and Georgian Baykeeper of Georgian Bay Forever. The Coastal Wetlands Great Mighty's Eradication Project, about 2011 we put some application ideas together for various funds and serendipitously the work that was being done in Lake Simcoe on cleaning up phosphorus and making that, uh, that lake much cleaner started to the idea was they would redirect some of that money towards uh, Southern Georgian Bay and start to, to uh, apply those funds into our areas. So we made an application when the fund first came out and were accepted and developed this program with um, money from Environment Canada to actually go out and use the community, educated community, to start to try to figure out ways that we could effectively have an impact on these invasive species. And we should mention too, this is one invasive species. There are many, many other invasive plants out there, right? Um, and one of the other ones that you've probably seen is the Eurasian water milfoil, which has just gone everywhere too. So, um, But this is one that we felt we could actually do something about. It was visible, it was above the water. Everything that happens below the water is kind of under the sparkle. Everybody gets mesmerized by the sparkle of the water, how beautiful you know, George Bay is, what it looks like. This was a project that everybody could see because it was in their way, right? It was preventing people from seeing that sort of thing. So this project uh, takes teams, and this was Katrina. She was mentioned earlier, our, our community coordinator. Uh, this was in Honey Harbor, right in uh, Church Bay. At that point between what used to be an island and the mainland when the water levels were up, but lately has just been a big peninsula, um, and it all filled in with great mighties. I mean, it just totally got completely filled with great mighties to the point where there was no water basically in that. It was just drying, drying the, uh, the ground right out. So we went in and selectively cut out only the invasive great mighties. It's labor intensive as we've heard before, but the beauty of this project is, number one, there are no overwater chemicals that we can go and apply to right now anyway, so it's something we can do right now. And secondly, you can see the native ecosystem re-emerge as you go along and do yeah. it. So our, our neighbors, our Great ecosystem awesome. neighbors, were quite happy to see this. And you came popping fast along. Um, but also, you know, it does build community. And we've heard that earlier. These, these projects start to, to give you that sense of community. There's a common purpose, and people kind of bond together and go out and, and do their work and then have a drink together. And then, you know, we're here to look at how to preserve. And this is one way to preserve the coastal you know, wetlands right now. The restoration work that we did um, down in Collingwood at Lighthouse Point was quite remarkable. This was a community beach at a community or at a condominium community that was built up. And they had tried to preserve, you know, a boundary layer for their community where they, they really were trying to keep an envelope of natural shoreline when they built the condominium, because it's a real draw. If you have uh, you know, a condominium that you move into and it's just sterile beach, it, it didn't have the same kind of um, attractive draw for the people that wanted to live there as one that had natural ecosystems and wetlands and all kinds of you know, flora, fauna, birds, and things like that using it. But they were down to about a kayak's width of the access to their water. Um, and you can see that kind of out at that point there. And Frag Mighty's just started to completely take over on the uh, right side of your picture there. All of this is inundated with Frag Mighty's. And it started cutting across here and re-establishing even on the other side of the water. And you've seen those pictures of the stolons and 60, 70 feet of stolon. Um, the rhizomes might only be a couple of feet a year, but those stolons that go just on top of crazy. the ground are just that crazy. So the community, uh, we went up and did some education, uh, which will be part of the program that we're talking about doing uh, you know, this summer, is setting up workshops to train people on how to identify it. There are some times when it might look very similar, and we can show you kind of the, the, the tricks to know which one is which, so that you can keep the native species and actually just go about targeting the invasive. How to cut it, um, how to, uh, like the tools, physically we can even have tools that we can make available to go out and do these cuts. 
We do have money under these programs for communication pieces and things like that. You know, um, maybe even a little bit of community advertising so that we can get people aware and involved. And that's something this summer that's a, a real big focus for us is actually getting teams together with community uh, champions in place to help us go out and actually do the work in the field. And, and we have resources that can help you do that. It's an experience. Too. So out, uh, you know, working, we would cut out into the water even, um, tarp the cut stalks, and a couple of guys just spent their day kind of going back and forth with their water shoes on and dragging it up onto the beach. Uh, we then dried it all out. Yeah. And we then got smarter and went back this last fall to the town of Collingwood, asked for a letter of support so that maybe we could get them to actually bring the composting, compacting truck to us and we can just load it right there on the beach. They can compress it and take it over for us. So we have a letter of support even for this one of our projects from the mayor of Collingwood. And at the end of the, uh, the cutting period, this is the natural ecosystem about a week and a half of the time. Elapsed, people live in this community and as they're walking by and they see people working, they may say, hey, you know what, I got an hour, I'm gonna help you right now. Having people and the tools kind of there in the community and accessible means you can do that. You can take 15 minutes and you're still making a contribution. You don't have to plan an entire day and you know, put everything together and get your lunch basket and all that kind of stuff, right? So on your own property, certainly exactly the same type of thing. It doesn't all have to be done at once, nibble away at it over a couple of days and you can accomplish a lot. But just a beautiful kind of pristine now native ecosystem with the, the native plants now having a chance to come back. Now the bad news is that's going to be inundated again next year. Right? This is not a one year commitment and we've heard that a couple of times. This is probably going to take three to five years depending on the standards there. But the protocol we're trying to establish is one that takes the maximum amount of energy out of those rhizomes, out of the root systems, removes that biomass physically so we're not leaving standing stalks, which again can aerate the lower ground surfaces and also prevent water from inundating in and out of the system. Um, and then remove that material and then come back the next year and have to do it again. We know that. So we're just stealing everybody to the idea that you're going to have to do this over, over a period of time, right? But it's going to work. We will win. We can. The next steps for the project this summer really, and you've heard them, you know, kind of talk about here, but the documentation piece, so not only identifying where, but we want to actually have a little more detailed map, so we have to go back to the funders and say specifically how many hectares did we, you know, cut. But certainly knowing where to go look, where these stands are is very important. So all of these are kind of knitting together as part of the tools. Um, teaching people through education as to how to identify these plants and also, you know, along the way, what are the native plants and what are the benefits of those native plants? And how can you tell in a wetland that it's a healthy wetland? What kind of plants grow in the healthy ones versus degraded ones? So maybe beyond this project, you'll, you'll find other things in your community at your local wetland that you could do that would actually help improve the quality of the wetlands that are there. You may not realize they're degraded or under a lot of stress. The partnerships, again, has been mentioned. This is not something one group, one place can do on their own. Trust me, there's enough right mighty. If you actually expand it out and look at the North American map, that's when it gets really depressing because there's stuff everywhere. But that doesn't mean we can't succeed keeping it A in the coastal wetlands, right? And focusing on those new areas where it is small right now prevents them from establishing themselves and becoming seed repositories or points of spread for others. Anyway, we, we, we know that with uh, people that are out there who have property right now, you can take action on your property. Um, if you're not using power tools, and this is one of the reasons why we stayed away from them, we have a letter of support for the project from the MNR saying we can even go on Crown property and cut it if we're using non-powered, handheld tools, if it's the invasive. But it, we have to know that we're educating people properly and doing that stuff. So that, that's kind of on the you know, development side of things. We've got a lot of partnerships and a lot of people that we're working with. On the, and that will be in the early part of the year, right? We can do mapping May, June, July, that kind of time period, early July. By the middle of July, we want all the work plans done because we need to start looking at cutting, actually the eradication part of the project. And this is when the plant is 
fully kind of grown up. All of the energy is up there getting ready. They're set. The seeds are developing, but not set. So they're not actually viable yet. All of the energy of that plant, it thinks it got away with it. Right? Here I am, and I'm about to go wild. And that's when we take it right off. Cut it right out. So we have a couple of weeks, and it'll depend on the season, how, you know, if it's wet or dry, hot or sunny. The exact dates will vary a little bit. But that's when we need to get people out doing the cuts. Because it's not, this isn't something you're going to want to do, you know, every day of the entire summer either, right? So there are intense windows where we can actually make a, a pretty good impact on it. And that's the eradication phase. So the recruitment, we all have to be ready to go by, by you know, mid-July, so that July, early August, we're, we're cutting. The training needs to be done, the scheduling needs to be in place, all of the community leadership that we need that can help us recruit those local people, all of that stuff needs to be done by then, right? And that's the actual restoration work, and that's the field work. And that's fun, it's also intense. And Frank Mighty's is a fighter, so I have, you know, scratches and cuts and stuff like that. It's not the, the totally easy work, but it's nice work. And you're in the water or right near the water. Um, yeah, exactly. Or dirty. So these are kind of the zones that we're looking at right now. Um, zone A, B, C, D, E. And on the back table that was mentioned, there's just a sign-up sheet. If you're interested in becoming kind of the community champion, somebody in that zone is going to need your name um, to know who to identify for you to help us pull the teams together. If you're just somebody that's interested or has property where you'd like some more information, still identify yourself by zone so that the team leaders and zone leaders can actually make contact with you too. So the monies are coming uh, this year. We have four funding sources. The uh, Environment Canada Lake Simcoe Eastern Georgian Bay Cleanup Fund has money put into this project. The Ontario Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change through their Community Guardian uh, Fund actually gave us another grant for that. Um, that specifically will be focused in Area A. The uh, RBC um, Blue Water Project, we just got word about a week and a half ago that we were awarded a grant by RBC. It'll be our third as an organization, but yeah, on Frank Mighty's eradication and helping train people and get, up, get people out into the field. And then finally, our donors, because Georgian Bay Forever as a charity only does <coughs> the work that, uh, that's enabled by the generous uh, participation of our donors. So money directly from Georgian Bay Forever will go into these uh, projects too. We're here as your resource. I have the you know, honor and uh, privilege of serving as the executive director of this organization, but we're here to help you. We're here in the community to protect your water. That's our mission. So 